who you really are was never on a spiritual search, was never lost, never needed to be found. Who you really are was not pursuing happiness or peace or freedom, never looked for God, never wanted to be enlightened. Who you really, that's, it was only who you thought you were that wanted all that stuff because it thought it was separate. So it thought it needed to find something to cure its separation. It's not that you didn't need to find something to cure your separation, though you needed to lose something. See? You needed to lose your belief in separation. And that's all you ever need to do. Lose your belief in separation. Lo lose your belief that you are this little entity, this me, that's separate from all the other me's. There you go. I figured I'd play a little bit of uh, my wood flute to start the show off. I don't really have any... Um, oh, I don't really have any great ambition to be a an amazing uh, wood flute player. I got this, this one way out in... Uh, the western canyon regions i think arizona i just like to play it and it's uh, sort of helps me get into a place but uh, some very wise insightful words there on separation to open the show up and um, yes, it's all right there. The search is futile. <laughs> it's like somebody that's got a pair of glasses on their head and they're going around going, has anyone seen my glasses? Has anyone seen my glasses? You know, that's what the search is. But we still do it. We still get on that journey, right? I know it. I know that that's the truth. I've heard it enough times, but uh, you don't see me getting off the path or <laughs> just stopping and relaxing. Although right now I'm, I'm very relaxed once again. I will always do this in a very relaxed stage. But getting to our recap, I'll tell you what, the language. <laughs> the language I use sometimes is like, you know, you think that you need to be inside my brain to understand what I'm saying to the full full degree. Like you partially, you could get a hold of it, but there's a, a, there's a piece of it there that's kind of drifts off at the end of some of my thoughts that could just be tightened up a little bit. I'll work on that. Um, and uh, you know, just a a quick hit on that the mirror episode you know this microphone is like it's like a verbal mirror it's an auditory mirror right when i hear myself listening back to these shows it's like you know it's the same as me seeing myself in a mirror through my ears you know it's really kind of cool you know everyone you know i, I know not everyone's gonna you know start up a podcast and and buy into the Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame bit. But, you know, if you just recorded yourself, you know, for a little while there, I was actually going around video on my phone. I was using video and just videotaping conversations, different conversations I had with people and, and then playing them back and, and uh, getting a different viewpoint, like thinking about the conversation that I had with someone and, you know, having my view of that conversation and then listening back and watching the video and going <laughs> it was actually quite a bit different than than I uh, recollected it going nothing crazy but uh, so this microphone is like you know 
a mirror for my ears. I guess we'll have to, at some point, go through and see what mirrors all our senses. Um, but I'm going to intersperse some Alan Watts clips throughout this show. Let's kick one off right here. Well, you know, the biggest ego trip going is getting rid of your ego. Your ego doesn't exist. There's nothing to get rid of. It's an illusion, as I tried to explain. But you still want to ask how to stop the illusion. Now, who's asking? I mean, do you think, in the ordinary sense in which you use the word I, how can I stop identifying myself with the wrong me? <laughs> well, the answer is simply you can't. All right. So we were talking about that grand or the, the opening uh, recording. And then, of course, that, you know, separation of ego. So you remember those old um, commercials? Lego my ego. I think I'm going to title this episode three Lego my ego. Lego my ego. I kind of like that. And you know, this, this, for me, this whole show is like an ego trip, right? To think that you could get on the microphone and entertain people and uh, talk about yourself and, uh, and to think that that's actually going to be interesting. <laughs> You're on, the, you're on an ego trip right away. Um, but what's even, uh, what even takes more hubris, what even exemplifies the ego of this person speaking to you right now is that I decided I wasn't going to prepare myself for this episode. I'm preparing myself for future episodes this week because I, I said I'm not going to prepare myself for this episode just to see how big my ego can get in thinking that I could pull off. <sighs> not really even thinking about it all or preparing any kind of flow or, or thought. And, and speaking of the word flow, the the in some ways, not in perfect symmetry, but flow is the opposite of ego you know the ego is constantly getting you held up and then there's this flow state where you just you lose that and you're just in it and when you're in that flow it's like you're you're taking that ego trip to the other side where everything exists as one and everything is floating like butterflies you know like some of the old, um, I was an old, Alan Watts mentioned it, and there was an old sage, an old Buddhist monk or sage, or I don't remember specifics, but he was asked what it's like to be enlightened, and he said it's just like everyday life except two inches off the ground. So that's what flow is, you know, and um, I'm going to do a whole show on flow. People I know who I've experienced witnessing in the flow, um, and I think maybe enlightenment is just when you're in the flow all the time. So it's just like, you know, there's these glimmers you get of enlightenment. And you get these moments of flow that also coincides with that. So I, I don't know if my viewpoint on it, which is what you're going to get listening to this show, right, is... Enlightenment isn't so cut and dry that it's just like you're there or you're not there. I, I feel like there's these glimmers, and I've had these glimmers, and, and they happen sort of more consistently. Not consistently, but more often. Glimmers of enlightenment. Where it was just a moment where like I walk, like one day I was walking out of the gym, and the sun was just bursting, and like my head just tilted to the side, and the sun hit it, and I was kind of like just gliding forward with my eyes closed, and I just felt like a connection to everything, like total connective energy with the sun and the air. And it was like a glimmer of enlightenment, you know, it was like 
two or three moments. And then if I had to describe it, I'd say, well, I tilted my head to the side and the sun hit my face. And then immediately you're out of that flow. You're, you're, you're back into the ego. So uh, um, I do think that these, these glimmers of enlightenment happen. And I do think these flow when you're doing something that is just so easy for you to do and you just lose everything around you and you get into this flow. That's going to be a whole show because it has to be. It's just like a cool, cool, cool thing. I, I love it. I love seeing people in it. You see people in it, you don't even realize. If you don't really think about it, you don't even see it. But once you know about it, you'll probably notice more of people being in this flow state. Um, but yes, I was, you know really leaning on my ego thinking I'm just going to pull this show off talking into the microphone but hey I'm going to do it and I'm going to have Alan Watts help me along by interjecting clips so that I have less mic time and uh, I won't play this one but they just you should get on Alan Watts um, or uh or dot org and get the app you don't have to do it I, i'm never going to prescribe that you have to buy into anything that i say i'm not selling anything here right but if you get the app uh his son mark is posting like just you know they'll just pop up i don't even think it's a regular schedule which i actually love and they just, like, all of a sudden, he puts a new one up. And, and a lot of the stuff that's going up now is not stuff you've heard from Alan Watts before. And all the stuff that's out there, he's got some stuff, I think, in the vaults that he's pulling out. And he just posted a, um, a clip called uh, Love of Water or Love for Water. Love of Water. And it's so different. Like all the Alan Watts recordings are like lecture series and he's speaking very specifically in this frame of mind of like, and this one he's, he's, he lived for a while. I always say, uh, call him the sage of Sausalito. I have a poetry book I'm writing called Visions of Alan Watts, who was the sage of Sausalito. Um, Cause for a while he lived in Sausalito, California on a, um, on a houseboat in the water. He lived, the, the, the boat was a houseboat that was on the water and he actually inherited it or took it over. Someone who had it before, it was like an artist commune. I think even in, in the 50s, um, definitely going into the 60s. And people used to come, painters and poets and all kinds of people come on the boat and kind of do their thing. And then he kind of took it over and he had some great lectures he did from the boat um, with all kinds of cool people like uh, Timothy Leary and Allen Ginsberg. I think Allen Ginsberg was on it. But all kinds of cool people. And um, he did this recording. He said that they just, some people had just gotten this really great uh, recording device. And uh, he did this recording from the boat and there's like the lapping water and the seagulls in the back. And it's almost just like poetry. He's just talking poetry of like water and, and relating it philosophically, philosophically. So it's interesting because it's not really coming from like a a viewpoint of like a religion or a, a certain spiritual sect of something or or like it's not coming from any certain place it's just purely coming from him it interests the hell out of me and i've listened to it like 10 times already since it came out last week i don't even think it was last week it was like not that long ago um it's short. It's one of the shorter ones. I think it's only like 30 minutes long, but it's so good. Um, and uh, there's no ego. If you want to hear something that's spoken without ego, there's a good example for you. 
So let's delve into this ego of ours, right? Which the idea is to separate yourself from this thing and sort of just get down into who you really are inside and how do we do that when we've got this thing that exists we think it exists in our brain because that's been culturally how it's been presented um but uh it's 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 in there and it's just driving us driving us um to do all these crazy things I cannot possibly preach it to you because the minute you start thinking I should understand that this is this stupid notion again of I should bring it about when there is no you to bring it about. See that's why I'm not preaching. You can only preach to egos. All I can do is to talk about what is. It amuses me to talk about what is because it's wonderful. I love it and therefore I like to talk. If I get paid for it, then I make my living. And sensible people get paid for doing what they enjoy doing. And how do you get away? How can the person who's trying to fix themselves, right? And if you're trying to fix yourself, technically you're broken. And if you're trying to fix yourself and you're broken, the person who's broken is trying to fix themselves. And how do you get past that? How do you get past the fact that if you want to move forward, and say hey there's something wrong with me you're you're using that same tool yourself to try to fix what's broken it doesn't really work you know um and uh and this ego is a big part of it because you've got this thing that you're fighting and if you're trying to get rid of something that's the driving force in your actions <laughs> it's going to be like that saying don't let the devil know you're leaving town because he'll he's he then starts to work harder on you right so if you start telling your ego that you're planning on getting rid of it uh it's going to probably notch it up a bit and just really start working on you right and what's the biggest ego trip of all? The biggest ego trip of all is going around telling everyone you're trying to get rid of your ego. You know, really this the spiritual path sometimes when I see it and I and and it's just you see this all over the place now, right? Especially once you're into it. I mean, with social media and the internet, the moment you get into something, it's like you are bombarded by it. Um I've got some funny stories about that. But like, you know, you get bombarded by this spirituality and you start looking at it and going, isn't this the big this is like the biggest ego trip of all is everyone telling everyone how to be spiritual and the techniques this is the techniques you use. I I I don't think I talked about this. I think I I talked about this in 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 a um in, a, in, in one of the first runs I did on episode one that I didn't put out there. But I had a, uh, I was down in Asheville, North Carolina, and a Buddhist monk came up to me on the street and uh, started talking to me. And, and he, 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 he went back and forth and he had these books he wanted to give to me. And he gave me these books on Buddhism, some, you know, some stuff. And, uh, he said, now, do you want to ask me a question? Because I have a lot of knowledge. <laughs> and I was about to say, well, what I said to him was, well, you know, I have a lot of knowledge too. You want to ask me a question? And he said, you know, what's the meaning of life? And I said, I'm going to have to think about that for a little while. But um, I wanted, I should have said later on when I thought about it, I should have said, really? I mean, isn't that against everything that um, you've learned? That uh, you're imparting to me that you have a lot of knowledge but that's the hypocrisy of the whole thing right and eventually he said well you know people usually donate eight or ten dollars to have these books so really he was probably just trying to get a little money and it was an inventive way to do it i mean he had he he looked like he was a buddhist monk but uh, 
it was interesting anyway. It's a good story for me to have. But um, just to get back to that bombardment of the internet. God, I put in on one of these things the other day to try to get um, a quote for a shower to be changed from a tub shower to a walk-in shower. And I filled out some stuff because I thought, well, let me just get an approximation. It was really, it would be for my mom. Looking at, you know, if my mom, you know, I'm constantly at my mom's helping her. She's 87. She's very, very vibrant and healthy. But, um, you know, I just try to help her with stuff anyway. So uh, I, I fill out everything. And, and, you know, I know better. I mean, it's amazing how you know better about things and still somehow you find yourself going through this process. And I put my phone number and email in because I thought, all right, I have to put this in to, to get a quote of like what the approximation cost is going to be to do this. And of course, now I am just getting calls all day long, emails, texts. I try to stop them. I get on the phone with people and say, no, I'm not. I was just curious. And it doesn't matter. It keeps going. It keeps going. So we are bombarded in this world by stuff. I don't know if that really relates too much to the ego. But if we wrap ourselves around that, that thought process, we probably could get back to it. A lot of yoga teachers try to get you to control your own mind, mainly to prove to you that you can't do it. There's nothing, you know, a fool who persists in his folly will become wise. So they, what they do is they speed up the folly. <laughs> and so you get concentrating. And uh, you can have a certain amount of superficial and initial success by a process commonly called self-hypnosis. And you can think you're making progress. And a good teacher will let you go along that way for a while until he really throws you with one. Why are you concentrating? See, Buddhism works this way. Buddha said, if you suffer, you suffer because you desire. And your desires are either unattainable or always being disappointed or something. So cut out desire. So those disciples went away and they stamped on desire, jumped on desire, cut the throat of desire and threw out desire, but then they came back and Buddha said, but you are still desiring not to desire. <laughs> uh. <laughs> they wanted how to get rid of that. So when you see that that's nonsense, there naturally comes over you a quietness. In seeing that you cannot control your mind, you realize there is no controller. What you took to be the thinker of thoughts is just one of the thoughts. What you took to be the feeler of the feelings, which was that chronic muscular strain, is just one of the feelings. What you took to be the experiencer of experience is just part of the experience. So there isn't any thinker of thoughts, feeler of feelings. We, we get into that bind because we have a grammatical rule that verbs have to have subjects. And the funny thing about that is that verbs are processes and subjects are nouns, which are supposed to be things. How does a noun start a verb? How does a thing put a process into action? Obviously it can't. But we always insist that there is this th subject called the knower. And without a knower, there can't be knowing. Well, that's just a grammatical rule. It isn't a rule of nature. In nature, there's just knowing. Um... But uh, yes, you find yourself talking from the ego consistently all day long. And as much mindfulness, thoughtfulness, meditativeness that you want to put into it, you, you fall back into a slumber of the typical things that you do as a human being. And uh, focusing all day long on staying away from that is difficult. Um, and uh, I specifically find it difficult interacting with other human beings because you get in conversations that are the same conversations you've had your whole life 
with different interiors to them and um and you fall back into some of those patterns of talking about things the way you've always talked about them i do try i hate that word try i've had this conversation with somebody about this word try um and uh I don't like it. I don't know why specifically, but it's like I want to stop trying, you know. But um, as I proceed through my day, I don't want to, you know, speak about things in a certain way. I want to clear up, clean up my mind in that manner. But when you come across other people and you get in conversations, you find it very easy to go back into that and go back really deep into the ego and, and speak. And, and um, I find myself doing it all the time. So it's like the, I do understand because I was always very, very social. I was always out there. I always, you know, would meet somebody for lunch and we get into conversations and we talk about everything and. You know, people would ask me my opinion on this or that. And for a little while, I called myself the idea man because I had ideas for everybody. Uh, I, I was like, I have an idea, but I don't want to be involved. And uh, it was a funny thing. It was fun to do, but it really was like always like analyzing these situations and putting yourself in position to be judgmental or, you know, to assess things very in a flip way um so but i was always very social and always really out there and, and you know love just going around and being around people not that i don't now but i do understand now when people stay away from that want to be alone more and um some people do that just because of whatever reason they just don't want to be around people but some people do it because i think because they're sensitive and they're affected by what happens when you're around people and that you kind of lose a little bit of control of this development of yourself if you're in a process or you're trying to create a way of being for yourself that's different and that's moving in a in a direction of this growth we're talking about. We'll call it spiritual growth. I hate to attach words to anything. You have to, I guess. This is that language thing again. Where like you need language, you need words to communicate in this way. So then you end up using words that you don't always want to use. But um, this, this growth thing that you're kind of doing, um, if you're doing it, you... It's like you don't want too many people's hands on it. You know, you're kind of, you got a piece of clay and you're molding yourself into something. And every interaction you have is like sort of somebody grabbing it and putting their fingerprints on it. So I do understand that uh, the alone time much more than I used to understand it. Um, and not everyone around you, not everyone in your life is going to get this kind of stuff. Some people in your life get it in spades. They, they, they really understand it or they try to be understanding of it. Um, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, whether it's the thing to do or not. You know, if you decide to do it, that's one thing. If I decide to do it, that's my thing. But I would never, ever... And this is a non-ego statement. And it, 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 I'm being sincere about it. I would never look at someone else and go, well, why aren't you doing what I'm doing? Why aren't you on a spiritual path? Why aren't you trying to accomplish these things? You know your life will be better if you do this way. I am not saying that to any capacity to anybody around me. Um, the people around me have their approach to what their life is going to be. And this path of, of growth 
it's a little bit of a struggle. It just honestly is a struggle. It's not the easiest thing in the world. You feel that and you hope that with your steps and as you progress forward that there's there's going to be a payoff. And it's really, uh, uh, what's the word? It's counterproductive to what you're doing to think that way, to think there's going to be a payoff. It is counterproductive to think there's going to be a payoff. But somewhere in, inside of you, you think, this has got to, the light's got to shine here somewhere. And then there's other people around you. They're, they're not on this path. And they're happy as can be. They, they're enjoying themselves. They have a certain freedom of spirit. Um, it's not to say they're not going to go through hard times or whatever. But And so why judge that to any degree? Let, the, let everybody live their lives the way they want to. And hopefully not interfere too much with everyone else's lives. So there's people around me that are on these kind of journeys so they totally understand it there's people around me that really aren't or and they're, they're interested in it maybe but they do they're understanding people who don't have a problem with it themselves and then there's other people that look at you like you're crazy to even think this way and um and for the whole roundabout of all of us that are, you know, this, this group of people I'm talking about that's in this little circle dealing with each other. We're all talking from our ego. It's all coming from our ego. Every bit of it, you know. And um, that's something to just understand. <sighs> well... I guess I pulled it off to some degree. I'm uh, coming to the end of the line, as I might say. I'm, tr I'm trying not to make these too long because I know my... <laughs> That's such a funny statement. I know my personality. When someone says, oh, I know your personality, it's kind of a fun thing. Like You could generalize a person that much. I don't think you can. Um, language once again right but uh, I know that I could tend to go on a bit more than I should if I didn't uh, you know have a timer going and just look over it every once in a while and go okay don't don't go too deep into it you know say, say what you got to say here you know if I around a half hour and you put your headphones on and go out for a walk it's kind of like a perfect walk 30 minutes right so we'll wrap up the ego for the moment and uh, those who are listening that know me next time we speak we'll talk from our ego once again those who don't know me and you're sitting there going Jay what the heck are you talking about well, that's all coming from your ego. So just chill it out a little bit. Um, <laughs> there's always this level of self-protection in things, right? I, I, I really don't want to do it, but you always like when you're putting yourself out there, you always create this level of self-protection with these phrases and thoughts so that uh, it's not painful of people have negative commentary for you. I feel like I'm making complete sense with everything I say. And then when I listen back, I just know I'm like, I should have really put more effort into making that point come across a certain way. Well, from me to you, Pearls of Wisdom, episode number three, let go my ego. And... Why not head this one out with another one of these Alan Watts insightful, beautiful, well-spoken 
such a warm voice. One of these recordings. Have a beautiful week. And we confuse ourselves as living organisms, which are one with this whole universe, with something we call our personality. Now, what is our personality? Our personality is what we call our image, our image of ourselves, and also our thought about ourselves, our idea of ourselves. This is the person. In other words, what people meet and understand, and what I understand as Alan Watts, is a big act which is not really me. Because in the image of Alan Watts, there are not all my unconscious processes, both psychological and physical. The construction of my brain is not contained in the concept Alan Watts. And the concept Alan Watts does not contain the inseparable relationships which I have with all the rest of the universe. And therefore that concept is a fraud. And when it's mistaken for the real me, there's a confusion. Because if somebody says to me, Alan Watts, do something about it. The concept Alan Watts can't do anything. In other words, because it's only a concept, you can't make it lift a weight just as three is a concept. Three, the number. You can't make just plain three do anything. So also you can't wrap up parcels with the equator. It's a useful imaginary line, but it can't do anything. But we all feel that this concept of ourselves, which we call our personality or our ego, can do something. <laughs>